W P H A T. You're listening to the number one health and wellness podcast, the place where health and consciousness connect. Perfectly, Perfectly healthy, healthy and tone, tone radio, radio, radio with your host, Darren McDuffie. And now, prepare to get fat. What's cracking, peeps? Darren McDuffie here, alias Fat Man, helping you become perfectly healthy and tone and conscious. You're listening to episode 173, Therapeutic Keto with Allison Gannett. Today's episode is being brought to you, as always, by PerfectlyHealthyAndTone.com. Wow, it seems like forever since I've done a podcast. I know I just did 172 with Leah Perriman, but that episode took a while to for me, honestly, to put up. And many of you might be wondering what's going on and why the episodes are not coming as frequently as they once did. But I've had a lot of life changes. I don't know. And I want to share with you that last year I had a severe bout with adrenal fatigue. I was tired pretty much all the time. And I believe that's the universe's way of telling me to take some time off. And then I had some personal changes. So I'm really just getting back into the whole groove of really getting the podcast and stay tuned and keep listening and the podcast will keep coming. But I just wanted to let my audience know that life happens to everyone. I am no exception. And right now we'll get into Allison's bio. Here is Allison Gannett's bio. Allison Gannett was diagnosed with terminal malignant brain cancer in 2013 and given almost seven months to live with standard of care. She's a keynote speaker around the globe on the topic of overcoming her terminal cancer and how others can reverse or prevent the root causes of the cancering process. Coming up on episode number 173 with Allison Gannett, Therapeutic Keto. Here's what you're going to learn. What are low-carb vegetables? Did you know there were high-carb vegetables and low-carb vegetables? I didn't know that. And when I heard Allison speak, I knew I had to ask the question on the podcast. How many cancer cells do we make daily? The answer will astound you. When is fasting good? I know fasting is all the rage right now. Everybody's talking about fasting and intermittent fasting. And we talk a lot about fasting on this particular podcast or episode. What is the difference in therapeutic keto and internet keto? There's a big difference and you'll learn that. How long does it take for cancer to grow? Cancer is not one of those things that it just happens all of a sudden. It has a period in which it takes to grow. What is the chemo sensitivity test? Did you know that there's a test out there that will help you to know if you will react good to taking chemotherapy. Allison talks about that on this podcast. Without further ado, let's get into podcast number 173, Therapeutic Keto with Allison Gannett. Allison Gannett, welcome to Perfectly Health and Tone Radio. How are you? I'm doing well, Darren. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Glad to have you on. I was a witness to your lecture at the West Palm Beach Low Carb Festival back in January. I was sitting in the back taking a lot of notes and I said, I have to have this woman on. And I'm so glad we were able to finally connect and get you on. My obligatory question to everyone that comes on my podcast is how did they start their health journey? How did you start yours? Well, my it's been kind of a wild roller coaster ride. I, I was kind of born as a adult child or a child of an alcoholic and so I ended up gaining quite a lot of weight when I was young and I was kind of dorky and really into books and math then I think in my teens and 20s I tried to prove to the entire world that I wasn't a dork and I became a world extreme skiing champion I jump off cliffs for a living I'm one of those silly people you see on TV and I thought I was really healthy because I had exercised a lot you know I I was eating kind of whatever I wanted because I was exercising so much, but I thought I was a healthy person. And then lo and behold, in 2013, I got diagnosed with terminal malignant brain cancer. I was given between six months to a year to live. And I realized at that point that the check engine light had been on for many years, but I had kind of chosen to ignore it. And now I was kind of facing death in... I 
I knew that I didn't just want to prolong my life miserably. So I did have surgery. I opted not to have chemo and radiation because that it actually was shown statistically to decrease my life expectancy. And luckily I found this amazing doctor doing a lot of research online and with the help from a friend, Dr. Nisha Winters. And she just looked at my labs and she looked at my DNA and she said, you know, there's a lot lot of root causes of your cancer. And if we re- reverse them one by one, then you won't have cancer anymore. And I was, as a, a scientist, I'm a climate change scientist. So I think really scientifically. And so I really liked her approach of just focusing on, on the root causes and tracking my changes uh, with my blood chemistry, using my DNA to customize my diet, customize what medications I could take. And I was so blown away with her methods that when she asked me to train with her, I think it was in 2015, uh, I trained with her for a year and now I'm an oncology nutrition coach and Mm -hmm. love to help people conquer and prevent cancer. Let's, let's, Let's go back for a minute because my experience with my mother, I told you before we even started the podcast, was that I lost my mom in 2005 to breast cancer, but I know that there were some signs that came about for her before she even was diagnosed. And I remember them taking out her lymph nodes from under her arm. And to me, that was a sign. I didn't know it at, at that point. But now, as I know a little bit more about it and gotten more into nutrition, I knew that it was a sign for her to say you know, something's wrong. But you mentioned that you had that check engine light. What were some of the things that were going wrong before you actually were diagnosed with cancer? Well, I think my whole life, if you if I trace back now, if I look at it objectively, I think before I got cancer, I would have said, oh, I'm really healthy. But looking deeper into it as a child, I had a lot of ear infections as a child, which would indicate that I was probably allergic to wheat and dairy at a very young age, put on a ton of antibiotics as a kid in, you know, in those days, you always suppressed fevers and colds. And I got shingles at 18, which um, my doctor Nisha said is like a surefire sign that your check engine light is on. I got Epstein-Barr virus, mono, as everybody knows it in my teenage, actually in my twenties. That's another sign that your immune system isn't doing very well. I had a lot of arthritis pain in my joints from all the skiing, but I thought it was just due to the fact that I'd had so many surgeries and I had such a tough job as being an extreme athlete, but all that has since gone away when I changed my diet. I had polycystic ovarian disease. I had breast fibroids. I had chronic uh, yeast infections, chronic bladder infections, chronic bronchitis. I had migraines. I had a thyroid condition, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. I had seasonal allergies, which have also, all those things I just listed have all now gone away. So, you know, I just thought like, oh, I'm getting older and, you know, my body's not doing as well. And, but lo and behold, really everything under the hood. I mean, the check engine light was on like times 10. Yeah. I think a lot of people ignore those signs and then it's one sign after another sign and another sign. And then finally you get the big boom, which with most people could be, could be cancer. But I wanted to go back with asking you about your diet because I know we share similar parallels of being athletes and I can remember when the biggest thing for me was after a game in college I would go into the locker room and we would have pizza and coke waiting for us and I would eat I would eat like maybe a whole pizza by myself a whole extra large pizza and then down it with coke what was your diet like when you were an athlete. And I, I remember from uh, your lecture, you were telling me that you were, you were saying that you were going into being a vegan, vegan vegetarian, but what was your diet like when you were at the height of competing? Well, I was vegetarian for 16 years and I also tried vegan upon my cancer diagnosis because it was something I had read on the internet. But as an athlete, I could eat anything I wanted. I was the same as you, you know, I'd come back from a long workout or a competition and, you know, I could eat an entire large pizza and then, you know, I would sit down and eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's and I might even like open a second pint. Like, you know, I ate a lot and being a fat kid as a child, um, I now had exercise that could allow me to eat whatever I wanted, which 
was kind of a blessing and kind of a curse. And then I started to clean up my diet in about 2009 before I was diagnosed. It, because in 2010, we actually bought our organic farm that we live at now, my husband and I. And we started growing and raising all our own food. And then I thought, well, now I'm now I'm even healthier. I'm Everything I eat has been grown by our hands and all our animals we raise here, all our vegetables, all our fruits. But, you know, I didn't know that, like, a peach had 27 grams of sugar. And, you know, I, would, I could eat, like, four peaches a day when our peaches were ripe on the tree. So unbeknownst to me, even though I had cleaned up my diet as far as chemicals and additives and I wasn't eating at, like, Chick-fil-A, I still was not healthy on the inside. My blood sugar levels were really high. My inflammation numbers were really high. My immune system was really low. So since then, I got diagnosed in 2013. I have been on a therapeutic ketogenic diet since 2013, since my diagnosis. And it has just changed my life. You know, all those maladies that I listed that just thought were old age or too much pro athlete or just genetics, they all went away. And, and the cool thing that I do now is, uh, as a diet coach is I customize my own diet due to my blood chemistry and my DNA and my health history. But now I get to do that for other people. And I really do think one of the mistakes we make as a culture is like, what is the best diet? Like, I wish we'd just stop asking that question. Obviously, a diet low in sugar and carbs and low in processed foods is important, but how do we take it to the next level and really customize that diet for each individual person so that they can be optimally healthy and hopefully not go through what I went through and your mom went through? Yeah, we have that that blanket approach, and I don't think that that works for anyone. And I think we have that uh, blanket approach for cancer as well. And a lot of people, Mm -hmm. there are some people that do well with the chemo and the radiation, and then there are some people that don't do well with it at all. But what made you decide not to do the chemo and radiation? Because I know once people tend to get that diagnosis, they go into fear mode. And the first thing that's tossed out at them is cancer and I mean, chemo and radiation. And then they go down that road without ever giving themselves a thought of an option. But what made you not go down that road? Well, and I'm not going to say that people shouldn't do chemo or radiation because, you know, what my doctor does is she looks at each client's DNA and each client's blood chemistry, their tumor pathology and their health history. And you can actually see like in your DNA, whether you're going to tolerate chemo, how well you're going to do with things like radiation, how well you're going to do with certain like immunotherapies or different kind of clinical trials. In my case, my DNA did not process chemo well, did not process radiation. Also, my doctors, even though they told me that I had to do surgery, chemo, and radiation, they they didn't tell me that even if I did all three, that I was going to die, that people with my type of cancer just don't live. And I found that out on the internet because my doctors weren't completely, in my opinion, honest with me. And when I found out that if I did all those things, surgery, chemo, and radiation, and had really low quality of life, that most likely I wouldn't make it anyway. So I wanted something that was going to give me a long, happy life and die of old age. And what Dr. Nisha was saying of working towards my optimal health, and if I had my optimal health, then my body is going to be able to prevent cancer from occurring and and also working on killing um, any cancer cells that are in the body. You do a more rigorous keto versus, uh, and I believe that I was watching one of your videos just preparing for the show, and you said that therapeutic keto is different from internet keto. I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the way I define a therapeutic keto is when your ketones are somewhere between three and seven. And hopefully, eventually, over time, you get your blood sugar in the 50s and 60s, maybe on a bad day in the 70s. So most people on internet keto, they or they tell me they're keto, um, and then I say, okay, we'll test your ketones. 
And when they finally do, most people's ketones are something like 0.5, like quite low. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that works perfectly fine for things like weight loss keto, but it doesn't work very well if you've got some kind of disease that you're trying to fight, such as diabetes or heart disease or cancer or Alzheimer's. You need to have high levels of ketones. You need to have really, really low levels of blood sugar. And then on the other side of that, internet keto to me seems to be like sausage, cream cheese, and heavy cream. There's not much attention paid to the food quality. Everything that I I eat and recommend for my clients is grass fed, grass finished. Everything's run through the safe seafood list on ewg.org. Also trying to get five to nine cups of vegetables into the diet that are organic and chemical free. And so very, very high emphasis on vegetables. And then using the DNA and blood chemistry to look at potential downfalls for each person. You can see in DNA, like if you can process dairy, lactose, or if you can process casein, which is in dairy, or how you process proteins. Should you eat red meat or should you not eat red meat? If you have a gene called HFE, which is like genetic hemochromatosis, then you might be a really good vegetarian. But if you have a gene that's the opposite of that, like myself, I need to actually eat more red meat than most people, most clients that I have. So dairy, protein, and then really interesting is how we process different types of fat. Some people are gonna process saturated fat like coconut oil, uh, butter, lard, tallow, things like that. They're gonna process that really well. And then some people like myself, I have a gene called APOE4. I also have another gene called APOA2, uh, sorry. I don't have APOA2. I have ACSL1. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a bunch of genes that don't process saturated fats very well. So I have to be a lot of monounsaturated fats. And then it's really, really interesting when you get into carbohydrates and vegetables. One person, like my doctor, Nasha, she can actually eat quite high carbs. Um, she can even have small amounts of like papaya and she can still be in ketosis. I'm the exact opposite. If I even look at a head of cabbage or some coconut, I basically, my ketones go to like zero. Yeah, everybody's genetically different. One thing that astounded me when I was listening to your lecture was the fact that you said you do five to nine, what is it, five to nine cups of vegetables? Yes. How do you get that many vegetables in your diet? Because I know people who aren't eating one cup of vegetables. So how are you getting five to nine cups of vegetables in your diet? Well, first of all, those are measured before they're cooked. So that makes it seem a lot more doable if you think about it. But I basically, I have a list of ultra low carb vegetables and then low carb vegetables. And basically on that list is everything leafy. And people think that, oh, that's not a lot of vegetables, but I'm a farmer and I'm able to grow leafy greens, leafy different colored vegetables really easily. And I suggest people do what I call my farmer's market trick, which is go to your farmer's market, ask the head of the farmer's market who uh, grows leafy things year round and get in touch with that farmer. And of course, they've got to be chemical free They don't have to be certified organic, but they can't be sprayed or using any kind of synthetic chemicals. Um, And ask for a big bag every week. One big bag is cooking greens. So, and then the other big bag is salad greens. And so I pick those for myself. And then I also pick them for other people. Uh, In my fridge always has like two big bags, the stir fry bag and the salad green bag. And I use all the, I have always have like a big salad every day, but then I take the stir fry greens, I'll slice them up into noodles for like soups or I'll stir fry them up with some eggs or I will throw them in a stir fry. And the cool thing about that farmer's market trick is that all those vegetables are seasonal And they're all like super fresh. They've usually been picked, even if you buy them from another farmer, within the last couple of days. And the other cool thing is that there really is a lot of variety in that bag because you're letting the farmer choose for you. 
Like for instance, the two bags in my fridge right now, um, there's probably 20 different leafy things in the stir fry bag and 20 different leafy things in the lettuce bag. And so it's really easy, like for example, what I'm gonna make for lunch today, which is actually my breakfast, will usually be like a big salad dressed with olive oil. Then I'm gonna have sauteed greens, like several cups of sauteed greens. Um, cooked in another type of fat, let's say avocado oil. Then I'm going to probably have like a protein such as bacon, um, cooked in bacon grease. Then I'm going to have maybe kale chips, um, some kind of leafy green that's cooked into a chip um, that's also going to go on top of my salad. So I'm always trying to have as many different vegetables as I can in that meal. I also puree greens such as like cilantro or parsley or oregano or green onion. Um, I puree those with olive oil into a salad dressing. So I'm getting more greens. Um, So actually I can have like one bowl of salad and have nine cups of greens in that one bowl of salad. I believe I also heard you mention when you were lecturing that you do a higher amount of fats. Is that that correct? Well, therapeutic keto, Mm -hmm. um, the fat target is is set depending on um, if you want to lose weight, gain weight, or maintain your weight. And therapeutic keto is way different than internet keto. Internet keto is generally for weight loss. So uh, once I got to my target weight of 120, I then needed to up my fat intake so that I wouldn't continue to lose weight. So in general, I will eat about two cups of fat a day to maintain my weight. If I want to lose weight, I'm going to be on the lower end, probably about a cup of fat a day. For those that are tracking macros, if I want to lose weight, you know, and everybody's different, which is why it's so cool to use apps like chronometer.com, is you can actually put in like your height, your weight, your exercise, um, and then it'll set your carbs for you, it will set your protein for you, and it will set your fats for you. So a lot of people eat too much protein on internet keto. For therapeutic keto, protein can convert to sugar. So protein will be set according to your weight. For me, it's like 43 grams a day, which isn't a lot of protein. But then I'll probably have about 200 grams of fat per day. And I always have my carbs really low, less than 20 grams of carbohydrates a day. Going back to talking about veggies. And this is something that you introduced to me. I had no idea that there were low carb veggies, high carb veggies, and medium carb veggies. It was just like new terminology when I was listening to your lecture. But talk about that as far as what's a low carb for vegetables. And one of the things that I think people tend to do, because I know I used to do this, I would throw vegetables into a category all their own without really, without realizing they were carbohydrates. So right. I want, yeah, I wanted you to talk about that and then talk about the low carb veggies, high carb veggies and and medium carb veggies because that was totally new to me when I heard it from you when you were lecturing in West Palm Beach. Yeah, I think the easiest way that I try to explain it to people um, because including myself when I was growing and raising all my own food, you know, I was eating all my vegetables out of the garden and I was eating my fruits out of the orchard and I just, I really didn't, to me, I didn't eat any sugar, you know, because To me, I wasn't eating like a Snickers bar. So I didn't realize that a peach could have more sugar than a Snickers bar or that a slice of whole wheat bread would keep my blood sugar higher longer than, let's say, that Snickers bar. So then I started eating a lot of vegetables and thinking like, oh, how great I'm doing. But my ketones still weren't very high. And once I got on to chronometer and entered what I was eating in a day, I realized that I was just eating too many vegetables that were actually fruits. So I was eating too many avocados. I was eating too many um, tomatoes eggplants, cauliflower, cabbage, all those kind of like thick and dense vegetables, as well as a lot of those vegetables like, you know, tomatoes, cucumbers, um, and eggplants. Those are all actually fruits. Avocado is a fruit. So I started having to track what I was eating. And that's when I really, really shifted to my ultra low carb vegetable list. But everybody's different. Like I have clients that can eat a cup of cauliflower 
and still be in ketosis. I am not one of those people, unfortunately. I can only do cauliflower like a condiment, but I have to eat really low, low, ultra low carb vegetables. And I think the easiest way for me to describe it to people is if you think of like a receipt, like a light piece of paper, that's like kind of lettuce. And lettuce is the lowest generally carb vegetable that you can have out there. Then you look at it like a piece of kale. It's kind of twice as thick as lettuce. So kale actually has twice the amount of sugar that lettuce has in it. And then you take kale and you compare it to, say, cabbage. Cabbage is much thicker than kale. Kale, cabbage has twice the amount of sugar that kale has in it. And then you compare like cabbage to like broccoli. Broccoli is a lot thicker and denser than cabbage. So broccoli has twice the sugar, give or take, than cabbage. And then you compare like broccoli to like a tomato or an eggplant. And then you're talking about doubling the sugar again. So if you can kind of think of the density of vegetables and stick to the light and thin ones, if you're having troubles getting your ketones high enough. If you stick to those ultra low carb veggies, um, then your ketones will go higher. So you're, I get the vegetables. So you're eliminating fruit altogether because it, it raises the blood sugar. Is that a correct assumption? Yeah, you know, again, everybody's different. Uh, right. But for anybody that's dealing with keto for cancer, to start with, we're going to stick with 20 grams of carbohydrates. And if you're trying to get nine cups of vegetables, into your 20 gram budget, pretty much, you know, there's 11.8 grams of, of total carbs in an avocado. So, you know, an avocado is going to blow like over half of your carb budget for the day. So then how the heck are you going to get, you know, nine cups of vegetables in to your nine grams of carbs left? Like it's impossible. So people can spend their budget any way they want, but you really have to think of rebuilding your body's immune system and we need all those antioxidants and polyphenols that come from all the different colors. Like when we say eat the rainbow, eating right. the rainbow doesn't have to involve carrots and tomatoes. You know, it can involve Swiss chard that comes in, you know, a bazillion different colors. And that has 14 different antioxidants due to the different colors in that Swiss chard. Does, any yeah, does anything okay. affect us when we eat seasonally? Because I know I had a guy on many years ago and he was saying that you're only supposed to eat. Uh, f for fruit example, mangoes in a certain season, you're only supposed to eat this in a certain season. Does it affect anyone seasonally in what they eat or should they follow something more seasonally in, in, in eating? Well, if you look at our history over millions of years, we had access to fruits. We lived in one area and we didn't have, like if I lived in Colorado, I never would see a mango. So there is a lot to maybe eating where you live seasonally, but also there has been so much gene manipulation of fruits these days like bananas used to be disgusting they were about you know an inch and a half long and they were really bitter they have been improved so that they have lots of sugar same with apples same with corn same with peas um, all these fruits have been manipulated so that they now taste better and they now ha are a giant sugar bomb and they're av available you know all 12 months of the year so our ancestors would never have access they might have bitter crab apples for two weeks a year in late August, um, but they would never have apple access to an apple year round in a grocery store that, you know, has 16 grams of sugar in it. What, what's been your experience with um, people doing, I know you do the genetic testing for your clients, but what's your experience with people doing better with meat versus people not doing good with meat? Because I think, well, I remember I wrote a, read a book or was doing some research on uh, Donald Kelly, he was a dentist uh, way back who came up with these cures for cancer and his first thing was, hey, take people off of meat. And then later on, he discovered there were some people that did better with meat in their diets when they had cancer. So he kind of changed his tune. But I was interested in what you see with working with clients or some, is it 50-50? Is it 80-20? How does that work? There's no rule of thumb. Every single person is totally different. If you combine their tumor pathology with their DNA and with their blood chemistry, it gives me a clear picture of where their protein level is at. In 
in labs, we, you know, I aim for a very specific number in their protein target. And so then we customize their chronometer, their food entries, and then they eat that amount of protein. And then we retest their labs and see if how their numbers are looking. You know, you're also looking at numbers like B12 and look, leaky gut and choline and there's a million different building blocks uh, that protein has. It's really important to eat the rainbow for vegetables. It's also really important to vary your proteins. But you can look at your DNA, and the DNA will give a pretty clear picture of what proteins you can digest and what proteins you cannot digest very well. And so the DNA gives a real basis of like what kind of fats you should eat, what kind of proteins you should eat, and what vegetables that you should also focus on um, because everybody's DNA is different. And then you have to look at labs, their blood chemistry, and see if that particular gene is expressing itself or not. Just because you have a gene for, let's say, Alzheimer's, then you have to look at your blood chemistry to see if that gene is expressing itself, are your, you know, is your insulin number high? Is your hemoglobin A1C high? Is your blood glucose high? Is you, are your triglycerides high? Um, and so then if all those things are, you know, obviously I can't list them all, then it's important to take action to correct your blood chemistry because it means that those genes are expressing themselves. Yeah, I imagine when you do your genetic testing, you're also taking into account ethnicity because... I did my I did a test and I didn't realize I'm a hodgepodge. Or I'm African, but I'm also other things as well. And I can going back and looking at that test, I can see how certain things affect me um, versus you know versus other things. But are you taking an effect on you know, ethnicity? Because I know people who have African heritage are going to be able to eat certain things versus people who have a more European heritage. Yeah, you know, there are some generalizations, like people from Germany tend to tolerate dairy better than other cultures. Um, but, you know, let's say if I had um, 2,000 people for Germany from Germany that I was consulting tomorrow, every single person would have much more specific genetics that I am looking at than just their ethnicity. You, yeah, same from, you know, if I did your entire family, Everybody would be slightly different. I would think so. Me and my sister are different. Because <laughs> when we tested, I called her. I was like, hey, do you have this? And she's like, no, I don't have that. I'm like, oh, okay, that must be for my father because we have different fathers. So I found out that, you know, I have some things that are within me that she doesn't have. So we're not, I mean, we're from the same mom, but we're, we're a little bit different. So I can see, you know, taking that into effect. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you too, and I, I remember this vaguely, and I wanted to just make sure I can confirm this. You said you work with a team of doctors when when doing your your stuff, when you're looking at your your markers and all of this different stuff. Is that correct? Me personally, you do you mean, or my clients? You personally. So I have twelve different doctors on my team, and mm -hmm. I consider Dr. Nisha Winters to be kind of the conductor of that team. Right. Um, kind of working in tandem with myself, you know, at the top of the pyramid. And then, you know, I use different doctors for different things. Like most people don't know that any doctors that, that is licensed by the American Medical Association, they can only recommend surgery, chemo, radiation and clinical trials, immunotherapy for cancer. So I actually don't even discuss my therapeutic ketogenic diet or my alternative therapies like hyperbaric oxygen with those doctors because it, they're not allowed to discuss them or they lose their license. But my neurosurgeon my, is an amazing neurosurgeon and my oncologist is amazing. I have a neurologist that's amazing. I have a couple general practitioners that are incredible. They help me order my labs. And then, you know, there's all the other stuff to support my well-being. You know, I have a tapping instructor for my mental emotional health. Uh, I have meditation teacher for working on my decreasing stress, you know, and then there's all the supportive therapies like massage and acupuncture. But I think everybody needs to come up with the kind of the team that works for them. Because one person, surgery, chemo, and radiation is going to make sense. The other person, maybe surgery won't make sense. The other person, maybe just surgery. 
the other person may be just chemo. But I think at the base of all what you decide for treatments, you do have every single day our bodies, your body, my body, every single person in the universe makes 500 to 2,000 new cancer cells every day. And so what we put into our mouths in our de- every single day and our lifestyle every single day is going to determine whether those stem cells that are new cancer cells, if they become a problem or not. It, it seems to me like, and I don't know about you, Allison, but it seems to me like more and more people are being diagnosed with cancer. And this is going back to something you said earlier, and I believe that it's it, it kind of relates to what we're eating. A lot of people are eating a lot of processed food. Most people are eating stuff that's not sourced properly. Like I know that you, you grow your own food. You kind of grow your own animals. What, what is your feeling on that? And how many are you seeing an increase in cases of people that are coming to you or looking to you to work with you to to uh, deal with cancer? Well, you can look at the statistics on cancer. You know, it used to be like one in 20 and then it was like one in 10 and then it was like one in five. I'm not sure exactly where we are, but it's somewhere around one in two right now. I do think that there's many different causes. I think, you know, I have looked at healthy people and people with cancer. I see a consistent pattern of people with elevated um, blood sugar and insulin markers, whether they have cancer or whether they're trying to prevent it. And these are even people that are eating like quote unquote healthy. They're eating lots of whole grains and lots of fruits and lots of high carb veggies and, you know, their blood sugar can be exactly the same as the person next to them who eats at Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, and Burger King. I do think sourcing the foods is really important because I think um, we are what our food ate. So, you know, avoiding toxins in our daily life, whether it's our body products or our cleaning products or what goes on top of our food, Uh, You know, I see elevated liver enzymes all the time, and it can be from those three things. It also can be from unfiltered water. It can, you know, people are ingesting a ton of stuff in plastic, you know, so that's like an endocrine disruptor that cancer really favors. And, you know, so we've got our diet, which tends to be overly high in either processed foods. And if you don't have processed foods, it's high in carbs and sugar, it's also very, very low in fat. Fat is the building blocks of our of our entire body. Our cells can't be built without fat. And when my whole life I ate the low-fat diet because I was told that it was the right thing to do. And so now I eat tons of fat, and I nev- I've never been a uh, healthier weight. Um, and also all my proteins are very, very carefully sourced because I do think it's a combination of diet, lifestyle, and toxin exposure so we really have to minimize that toxin exposure and that fat is essential for a cancer patient because i know i didn't experience this with my mom she didn't lose weight but i've seen cancer patients who lose a ton of weight and that's usually because they're going if they're trying keto they're doing more of an internet keto right and you have to use a a tracking mechanism like chronometer.com and you have to put in your height your weight your activity level And then you're going to put a little thing in there. You're going to put rigorous keto, and then you're going to put, uh, I want to gain two pounds a week. I have um, some clients that need to eat somewhere between three and four cups of fat a day to gain weight. And, you know, so everybody's different. Everybody's numbers are going to be different, which is so cool the way we can customize it now. There was something that I wanted to congratulate you on because I've been trying to tell people this for the longest (laughs) and we seem like we have similar patterns of thought and I remember you were doing a lecture Uh, I can't remember what lecture but I was just looking over some of your stuff on YouTube and you were saying that people go on the internet and they find like garlic all these cancer fighting foods and they said eat eat garlic but you can't metabolize garlic because of your genetics and I worked in a, a, a food sensitivity testing lab many years ago and I saw so many foods that I was considering healthy but when I would look at people's tests 
people were sensitive to those foods and they were what I would consider healthy foods like avocados and uh, eggs and tomatoes and all these foods that you would think were healthy, but there were people who had sensitivities to them. So I wanted to talk you know, wanted you to talk a little bit about that to kind of get it across to people that, hey, you know, maybe just because people are recommending these foods, they don't mean that those foods necessarily might work for you. Exactly. And I think why it's why it's so important to do a, a DNA test and really to do a better DNA test. Um, 23andMe or Ancestry.com, they just don't give us enough information. You know, a test like Nutrition Genome dot com is much more thorough and is much more pertaining to our metabolism of food and drugs and toxins and hormones and vitamins and minerals. So it's really important to look at that. Um, but we are shifting away from food sensitivity testing uh, because of a concept that everybody has now due to stress and antibiotics and medication is Pretty much everybody's walking around with intestinal permeability, which is locally known as leaky gut syndrome. Right. right. So if like, for instance, if I have leaky gut and last week I ate a bunch of kale and then I did my food sensitivity test, because that kale leaked through the lining of my stomach or my small intestine into my peritoneal cavity, my food sensitivity test might come up positive for kale. But that doesn't mean that I can't process kale. That means that my stomach was leaky when I ate kale and got tested. So more and more we're shifting away from food sensitivity testing, the IgG and the IgM, and looking more towards genetics. So if I look at kale genetically, anything that's a cruciferous vegetable, brassica family, broccoli, kale, cauliflower, cabbage, those all have a lot of sulfur in them, and garlic has uh, allicin in it, which is also a very similar property. There's also cysteine, methionine, all those chemicals that are in certain foods. My body has a gene called CBS, and CBS doesn't process sulfur foods very well. And so I actually take a 5-methylfolate. Just because you have a gene, it's not like you're cursed. I can take 5-methylfolate. After taking 5-methylfolate, I can now metabolize brassicas like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, things, kale, things like that. But initially, like I heard, oh, kale's great for cancer. So I was pounding tons of kale, not knowing that I had this gene that couldn't process kale. That makes a lot of sense. And I think um, what you're saying does make sense as well, that the fact that if you do have leaky gut, all, a lot of foods are going to show up in in your test saying that you are food sensitive so it might be good to go to the dna level and understand you know what works for you and what what may work against you the other question i had is you were talking about ferritin which is iron and i couldn't get across whether in cancer is the ferritin high or is the ferritin low i want to say it's, it's high is that correct uh again it's totally depends on the person mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's so. Um, so ferritin can be high. Cancer likes to create a microenvironment around mm -hmm. the cancer cells with things that it loves, like uh, calcium and ferritin and uh, high glucose levels, high insulin levels, uh, low vitamin D three. You know, cancer is going to create this like picture perfect scenario for itself. So sometimes when people are in the cancering process, they, their ferritin can go from normal to like very, very high. And that is due to the cancering process. So that's why a lot of times you'll hear like, oh, okay, no red meat for cancer because someone has high ferritin. And so it really depends on that person's genetics. I'm going to look for the HFE gene, a few other genes that process iron. Then I'm also going to look at the ferritin, the iron saturation, protein levels in their labs, albumin levels in their labs, and come up with a picture-perfect plan for that person, which is always in flux. Um, I am testing my labs every month. My ferritin was historically very, very low due to leaky gut. So I've been doing a lot of bifidus maximus to fermented foods to help repair my leaky gut. Also, you know, I no longer take 
NSAIDs, no ibuprofen, no Tylenol, no antibiotics, um, things that are going to hurt my gut. And so as my gut repairs, my ferritin level has been coming into, you know, an, an optimal range. Chris Kresser, Dr. Nisha Winters, they're all talking about, you know, somewhere between 35 to 75 being optimal. But, you know, again, that's just a number I'm throwing out there. Make sure you check with your doctor. But, you know, people are different. People who have genetic hemochromatosis, like my husband, um, his ferritin is high naturally due to his DNA. And that's inherited um, and passed on in the family. And so the only solution for that for him is to eat less red meat. Well, I have to eat more red meat because of my uh, situation. Are we creating an environment for cancer for someone like, because I know a lot of women historically go to the doctor and the doctor says, you're, you're low in iron. So he gives them iron pills or some kind of formula. Oh, it's the worst thing ever, yeah. Never supplement with iron. Mm. And um, I have someone that's on that right now. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, I have seen Dr. Nasha put people, you know, that have like crazy, crazy low ferritin. She has a very specific type of iron that she only uses rarely. You know, it is much better to get that from your food. But I would say, you know, I would see about half of the people have really, really low ferritin and about half the people have really, really high ferritin. But then you've got to dig deeper. You've got to look at, you know, what kind of meat are they actually eating? Is it fed with GMO corn and soy and covered in toxins, all that corn and soy, and then it's eaten by that cow. Those things, like things that are injected into meat, like antibiotics, also uh, growth hormones are injected into conventional meat in the grocery store if you're not buying organic. And so those growth hormones, when you eat that meat with growth hormones in it, cancer adores that because cancer loves to grow. And so you're putting a growth hormone into your body. So it's super, super important that you know what your genetics are you know what your ferritin level is, you know what your protein level is, and then you eat accordingly, and then you make sure you eat clean, healthy protein. And then you've got to dig a little bit deeper into how you process things like glutamine, glutamate, glutathione, all those things. Um, those at high levels, if you can drive a cancering process as well. So it's very, very important that you look at your genes and your blood work. For someone who's gone into remission, and I've seen this with people who they've gone to remission, they never do anything to change their diet. And if they start this therapeutic keto that you are, is this a lifelong thing? And I, I guess this is a loaded question because there are, there are people out there who are saying that keto cannot be a long-term diet. But then I interview people like you and you've been doing this for quite a while and you're still seeing benefits from it. And I, I know it's a loaded question, but the first part of that is for someone who's gone into remission, would you recommend them start? going to this diet just as a safety net to say, hey, I just want to make sure that the cancer doesn't ever come back. And the second part of that question is, can keto be a long-term thing? Can people do this over a period of years and have still have the benefits and still not worry about, you know, the drawback of, of, of cancer or will that diet eventually change? Because I've seen people who have been on diets who their diet eventually changes over time. Okay. Remind me to make sure to answer those two parts. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to answer the second part first. First of all, um, if you go to pubmed.gov um, and you look at all the research on keto, there's actually been zero studies that have shown that it is a problem long term. And I don't know where that rumor started, but I do believe from all the conferences that I've gone to that it is a rumor that was started and it is not substantiated. Now, you're, that, being, that being said, real quick, Allison, I want to ask yeah. you this because it just came up. You're a person, you're a person that believes you're scientific. You have a scientific mind. You believe in study. Do you think we over equate too many things to studies because you're saying that there's no there's not a long-term studies on keto but vice versa i think a lot of people depend on those studies and i know from my pharmaceutical background you know how studies can be somewhat um finagled i'll use yeah, that word i agree yeah, i just yeah. want to say that people people keep quoting these supposed studies that say that long-term keto is not beneficial but there actually aren't any the second part of that is that every single person is different uh, and you have to look at blood work and genetics and determine what kind of diet is right for you. 
because every single person is different. And if you're not tracking, like I test my labs every month. I'm not saying everybody should do that. I just am a science geek. I love to try something and then test my labs and then try something else and then test my labs. And I see how my body responds to things like fasting or having the fats go up or having the fats go down or having the vegetables go up or having the protein go down or up or, you know, so I'm always testing how my metabolism works. And so I think that's really important because every single person, if I just looked at their genetics and their history and their blood chemistry would be on a different diet. I'm not going to throw everybody on keto. It doesn't make sense at all to even think that way. Now, have I seen anybody in the last three or four years without elevated blood sugar and insulin? No. The other thing is, is I do fear for the health of these quote unquote internet keto people that are promoting like, okay, you can just have cream cheese, sour cream and sausage and cheddar cheese mixed all together in a pan and that will cause you to lose weight. Yes, it will cause you to lose weight, but what's the quality of the ingredients and what are the micronutrients in those ingredients? Your, your macros might be fine, but are you actually getting any nutrition from that diet? Where are your five to nine cups of leafy vegetables so that you can round out your polyphenols, your antioxidants. You need to make sure all you have lots of different fats in your diet that you're not just re relying on one type of fat. Same with protein, same with vegetables. My, I guess my, my, what I'm getting from this is that you want to be a little bit more stringent when you're going towards therapeutic keto, because I've heard people, I've listened to podcasts outside of my own and I've heard people say, well, you can just start, you can just eat any kind, any type of bacon and start keto. And that sounds good for those people who are out there who want to lose weight. But getting from you is that you want to be a little bit more stringent when you're dealing with an illness like cancer. Is that a correct assumption? For sure. And I do think the internet keto will, you know, eventually catch up to people. But if it you know, if you want to help reverse your diabetes, and I mean, I know doctors that prescribe the ketogenic diet for diabetes and, and have clients that eat at McDonald's and eat keto. It, it certainly will and is possible to reduce your blood sugar in that way. But what we see is the cancer growth factors, whether you have cancer or you don't, will often go up if you have a lot of toxins in your food. And I'm going to bug you about that that first question, it was remission, going into remission. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, so, um, first of all, I don't like to use the word remission mm -hmm. um, because basically, we. I remember I mentioned that we make 500 to 2,000 new cancer cells every day. Correct. So if I tested you for cancer, you'd have it. If I, you tested me for cancer, we'd have it. We'd have these cells floating around. But those cells usually are just killed by our immune system and they never ever become a problem. So hence my doctor's non-use of the word remission, but what she likes to do is look at no evidence of disease. Uh, but if you also, if I went in for a scan and you know my scan came back clear, she's also gonna be like, okay, that's great, but let's look at your blood work. So then she looks at my blood work. She's looking for cancer growth factors like IGF-1, VEGF, fibrinogen, high protein, low protein, uh, high calcium. There's a, a huge long list of factors. Um, HSCRP, lactate dehydrogenase, sed sedimentation rate, all these kind of like, think of it as a, like a recipe for a stew. If you have enough of those growth factors be high enough, then you might come back negative on your scan, but your body, so you, the doctors would say you're in remission, but your body is still like inflamed and has a lot of cancer growth factors. So I always like to look at my body and my client's bodies with that critical eye. Is there anything here in your labs that given time could become a cancerous pro process in the future? Last question for you, Allison. You've gone through this process and you've had clients who are going through this process. Given that I go to the doctor Monday, 
and I'm diagnosed with cancer, what are some of the steps that I want to take in order to ensure I have the best possible outcome for recovery? Oh, that's a tough question. (laughs) (laughs) I think the biggest thing is to take a deep, deep breath and get informed. And getting informed is difficult these days because I think there's a lot of, like you mentioned, people are saying like, eat this, do this, do that. And it's it's not customized at all. Every single person's diet needs to be different. Every single person's lifestyle changes need to be different. Every single person has different toxins in their life that they need to get rid of. So I would say take a deep breath. Usually cancer takes seven to 10 years to grow. In my case, it took probably about 20. So all these doctors are sitting there putting the fear of life and death in your hands saying to me, like, to my clients, if you don't get in, you know, all these treatments tomorrow, you're, you know, you're going to have a lower chance of success. Well, you've got to remember that they can only prescribe surgery, chemo, radiation, clinical trials, immunotherapy, um, and they lose their license to talk about any of these futuristic things. Now, you can do conventional care with the futuristic things, with some alternative medicine. You're going to need to come up with your team, your recipe for success. But you want to get a first opinion, get a second opinion, get a third opinion, you know, send an email to me about coaching and customizing your diet. I would set you up with Dr. Nisha Winters so that she can work on your customized treatments. There, I think we have this we're just put in this massive fear mode, like you talked about, where we're really, really scared and we really want to feel like that we're doing the right thing fast enough. And, you know, if we don't get into chemo tomorrow, then we're going to die. Well, I mean, if the cancer has been growing from years and, or even decades, like take a deep breath, do some research, you know, have your doctor, if your doctor hasn't run a chemo sensitivity test, you know, if they don't even know what that is, then you need a different doctor. And, You know, my doctors didn't even look at my DNA before they recommended chemo. And then uh, we actually now have a really specific test where we can test your DNA's response to all the different types of chemo drugs and immunotherapy drugs. Mm -hmm. So before you even go into doing one of those, you can find out which one you can process and which ones you can't. So... Try to take a deep breath. I know it's hard. Um, And a great book out there for, um, she's not as up to date on the diet aspect, but she's really, really good at being your own cancer advocate is uh, Sophie Savage, and it's called The Cancer Whisperer. And, you know, there's, there's a lot more than just diet. We've got to look at all the factors that go into the cancering process. And they're so many factors. Allison, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. I know that you have a website because that's how I got in touch with you. Tell the audience um, about your website. Uh, it's alisongannett.com, A-L-I-S-O-N, G is in George, A-N-N is in Nancy, E-T-T as in Tom.com. Um, you can email me from there. I am going to warn everybody that there's Pretty much no one doing this DNA and blood chemistry and diet uh, client history as far as diet coaching out there. So I'm swamped. Mm. And I do have a team of uh, four other gals that work with me. So between us, we'll try to get you in. But I do warn you, I'm busy. (laughs) But (laughs) I guess it's a good thing. You know, I love the fact, um, I think the awesomest, I remember you saying in on your website, You said your mother's death from cancer saved you, and it was your rebirth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say that I think I I would never change a thing. The cancer has been the biggest gift that has been given to me. I mean, not only do I have a fabulous new career, I loved my life before. My love was life was amazing, but it's like ten times more amazing now. Um, I'm much more balanced person. And I also feel like such a strength from knowing that I am moving towards optimal health. You know, in the first couple of years, it's like, oh, you're in a panic mode, putting out the fires. But now I'm just like, okay, how can I make my thyroid work the best that it can possibly work? How can I make 
my immune system work the best it can? Um, how do I get more toxins out of my life? How do I get my inflammation down? How do I balance my hormones? How do I um, decrease my stress? Um, I'm always working towards another layer of optimal health. And I never would have had that if I hadn't had to go through this. Mm -hmm. I always say the the worst. I always say the worst things that happens happen to us are the things that happen for us. That's always been my saying. Oh, that's that's phenomenal. Yeah. I love. Yeah, a lot of the things that we go through are there for for our growth. And um, I I don't think I'll ever be doing this podcast if it wasn't for my mom and what I experienced with her. And even my my time in the pharmaceutical industry was just mm -hmm. uh, an added an added thing for me to be able to just be able to transfer the stuff to people so they can learn uh, a lot more about about their health. So Allison, I know this is Saturday. It's my, one of my rare Saturday podcasts. I wanted to get you off, but thank you so much for being on Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. I really enjoyed the interview. Well, thank you so much, Darren, for getting the word out. Um, it's thanks to people like you sharing your story who then reach out to me, share my story. And, you know, we're going to change the world one person at a time. And right. Spread our gifts, and I'm going to go check and see if uh, our cows are giving birth. Yep, you did say you had a cow giving birth. So, all right. Thank you so much, Alice. All right. Have a great day. All right. You too.